Uh, my name is Caitlin Augustine. I'm the Senior Director of Product at Datakind, and we're so excited to have you here to talk about using local data to drive housing loss decision making. Um, at Datakind, we're a global nonprofit that's using data science, machine learning, and AI in the service of humanity. And we do this through building partnerships with organizations like uh, New America's Future of Land and Housing Program and uh, with the support of innovative funders like the Rockefeller Foundation. And so you'll see all of these components of a successful project represented throughout this conversation and uh, through our panel discussion, because we believe that there are, uh, that we all have a role to play in delivering data science for social impact. Um, I'm going to introduce Datakind's um, former board chair, uh, longtime Datakind supporter, Zia Khan, who's the senior vice president of innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation. And one of the most inspirational speakers I've heard who talks about using data to drive impact and the power of making these bold ideas and bold investments come uh, to fruition. So uh, Zia, over to you to uh, just give us a, a little orientation to, to what this, this event and this initiative is. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for that uh, kind or, uh, introduction. And I'd also like to thank Oliver and the New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, Beta New NYC, Data Through Design, and also the Jacobs Urban Tech Hub, and all the subject matter experts, community leaders, and technical volunteers who contributed to the work of Datakind and New America. And I'm really looking forward uh, to this session here today. Let me just take a step back and describe the Rockefeller Foundation's motivation to partner with everyone here and, and how we see the opportunity. Over 100 years ago, the foundation was founded on a premise that we can use more scientific-driven approaches to solve the big social challenges of our day, data being a core element. Fast forward to today, where data is so available and there's been an explosion in data science techniques. When our president, Raj Shah, joined the foundation uh, to assume the presidency, he really put it as core and central to our mission of how do we re-energize the use of data and data science to solve so many of the big challenges that feel like they've been stuck for so long, but where we have some breakthrough potential. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see here today. So first, let me talk a little bit about the problem. I don't think I need to share with everyone how much of a stress COVID was, not only as a public health crisis, but as an economic crisis, a racial justice crisis, an environmental crisis, and on so many fronts. People were already under strain. People were already very vulnerable before COVID. We did some research and we found that the average family in the United States could not handle a surprise $400 expense. Well, you can imagine the effects of a surprise eviction or a surprise mortgage foreclosure. That kind of vulnerability of people who are really at the precipice is not only dangerous for what they might experience in the near term, but it can set them on a downward spiral in terms of homelessness, mental health issues. And it's just hard to get back onto the ladder once you have lost something that is so fundamental as your home and housing security. So it's a huge problem and it only got exacerbated more when COVID hit. The foundation had really committed over the past couple of years and pivoted a lot of our strategies to address this near-term issue of COVID, not only in terms of the pandemic response, where we did a lot of work on testing, but also to help address and protect people by getting them better access to benefits. And one of the ways to do that was to apply data science in a wide range of programs. And you'll hear from one of the leaders on our team, Kevin O'Neill, later today, who's been a real innovator in driving some of this work. But when we found this opportunity of how we could take some of the amazing data science techniques and approaches that Datakind and its amazing army of volunteers can bring to bear on a problem with a partner like New America that is legendary for its policy influence and tackling problems in innovative ways, we were just incredibly excited to see what can happen if we use data and data science to offer more precision to understand the problem and more precision to those who are trying to solve it so they can target resources, target attention, monitor progress and adapt better and going forward. So I'm not gonna describe all the amazing details of the solution because you have much better informed speakers who'll be able to share that. 
But all I want to say is just how excited I am to see this novel application of data science to a longstanding and critical problem, how successful it's been, and how I hope it can get replicated more broadly, not only in housing, which is a critical problem, but maybe some other similar problems, which is also one of the reasons we're so excited about the application of data science to social impact challenges. So, Kaylin, thanks again for inviting me to offer a few remarks, and let me hand it back over to you. Thanks, Zia, for setting the stage so well. Um, I, you know, it just the the uh, impact of evictions and foreclosures in the United States, and the fact that uh, as we started this project with our New America partners, realizing that so many jurisdictions didn't have access to that information and couldn't use it to make timely decisions, just showed the need uh, to apply data science, machine learning, and AI to this solution. Um, and so with that, I'm thrilled to hand it over to Mallory Sheff, Datakind's Portfolio Manager for Economic Resilience, to talk to us about the tooling and the solutions that Datakind and New America uh, propose to help solve this crucial challenge. So Mallory, over to you. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are in a different time zone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today to be able to share about our work with New America and the tooling that we developed together with their expertise. Um, so today I'm really gonna be sharing um, a lot more about the partnership that we drove forward with New America's Future of Land and Housing Program and more about our foreclosure and eviction analysis tool. To begin, I want to share, in addition to the incredible comments that Zia provided, a little bit of context as to why the work that we're driving forward right now is so timely and important. We know that housing insecurity is a persistent crisis in the United States. Nearly 5 million Americans lose their homes through eviction and mortgage foreclosure every year. And this already acute emergency was made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis, which put 30 to 40 million Americans across the country at risk of severe housing catastrophe. In New York City, the state just this past summer received more than 290,000 applications for pandemic rent relief program. And so this really reflects just here locally in New York City, the vast number of people that are behind on rent and that are potentially at risk for eviction. Yet, as Caitlin mentioned, local governments, policymakers, housing advocates, and other community-based organizations don't always have a very clear data-driven way to identify where housing loss is most acute and you know, who is most affected by this crisis. So in order to better understand housing loss across the country, we partnered with New America's Future of Land and Housing Program to leverage not only our skills in understanding data science and their subject matter expertise in this space. And so we've delightfully been partnering with the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America for over two years now. And we've really amassed an exciting body of work that contributed to the foundation of the tool that I'll be sharing later today. Together with New America's FLH program, we worked on two key reports, Displaced in America and Displaced in the Sunbelt. And through these two reports, we mapped and analyzed evictions and foreclosure data from 2017 to 2019 across seven U.S. counties. And we did this mapping at the individual record, which allowed us to visualize and analyze evictions and foreclosure data at the census tract level. And we did all of this work with New America to really understand past housing loss, because this really allows us to, to dive into a better understanding of the magnitude of housing insecurity at the census tract level through these different counties and communities, but also helps us better understand the areas that may, may be hardest hit during and after the pandemic in order to provide local communities information as to where to target their resources. 
And so the culmination of these two incredible reports and the knowledge that was gathered through this research and through a deep understanding of eviction and foreclosure data led us the to understand the true value of empowering local communities and local jurisdictions across the US to visualize their own housing loss data and enable them to then take action to make, mitigate against it. And so from this, together with New America's Future of Land and Housing Program, we created a global good toolkit, which we called the Foreclosure and Eviction Analysis Tool, also known as FEAT. And so the objectives of FEAT were really threefold. On the first hand, we were aiming to create an open source tool. And this would really allow local leaders and other community members to directly leverage insight from their own local data. It was also critical to us to partner with cities and counties across the country as subject matter experts and individuals who are using data every day, it was really critical for us to get feedback on the use of the tool to ensure both ease of use and its long-term sustainability. And lastly, through FEET, we wanted to ensure that the insights were relevant and useful to the work that these partner communities were driving forward. So for the, for the testing phase of this tool, DataKind and New America collaborated with 14 partner counties around the country to test and run FEET. As mentioned right before, it was really key for us to have this engagement from the very beginning of these subject matter experts that not only work directly in the field of housing security, but are trying to improve housing security for their communities. We wanted to better understand their wants and needs and determine what could be incorporated into the FEAT tool to directly support their work. And so I'm happy to share a little bit about what this FEAT tool really is. FEAT is a toolkit that is on a public GitHub repository and can analyze up to three different types of housing loss data. We can analyze eviction data, mortgage foreclosure data, and tax lien foreclosures, all at the level of individual unique records. Once the data has been collected, we provide a data template to format according to the requirements for the tool. And we also provide a required folder structure, which then allows us to run four modules of the tool on the provided data. So as you can see from this functional design of FEET, this toolkit is comprised of four primary modules of functionality. Our first module is the load module, and it is really just a set of code that helps to ingest accurately the data which has been formatted. This module is really important because it ensures that all of the three subsequent modules run smoothly and generate impactful analyses and visualizations. The second module is the transform module. And this is a module that transforms the given address data because as a reminder, we're working at an individual level. And so the records are individual. And so it transforms the address data and translates the street addresses into corresponding national census tract IDs. This is critical because it allows us to do uh, an analysis at the level of the census tract. Our third module is our analyze module, and it aggregates and analyze the eviction and foreclosure data that was provided or fed into the tool. And we analyze this against a set of 60 American community survey variables or census data. And these variables were chosen as the most likely to uncover important trends regarding the subpopulations that are most and least vulnerable to housing loss. The outputs of this analyze and third module, which I'll review in the next few slides, include a time series chart, correlation results, and an output file that can provide local communities, policymakers, and others users, other users of this tool to, to run any further analysis if they would like to. And our fourth and final module is the visualize module. Module four produces a packaged file 
that can then be imported directly into an open source GIS software. And this really allows for the creation of custom housing loss and demographic maps that provide visual information at a census tract level as to where housing loss is highest. And each of these four modules really perform critical steps in the data processing and analysis pipeline. And so now more concretely to sharing some output of the FEAT tool. So we ran FEAT on New York City open source eviction data from 2017 to 2020. But as mentioned earlier, before running the tool, we needed to ensure that the data met some key criteria. One, the data has to be recorded at the level of individual addresses or individual entries for individual evictions or foreclosures. It cannot be aggregated. The data, in order for us to geocode and provide these data visualization maps, must contain at least a, one of the geographical identifiers, such as the property address, which should include the street address, city, state, and zip code. If this isn't available, um, we might be able to find a corresponding census tract or zip code that can then be geocoded accordingly. And so we ran this feat tool after formatting the data on New York City data to really understand evictions in this, in this city um, for the past couple of years. So as mentioned earlier, the analyze module produces some key visualization outputs. Uh, this, first, this first output is this time series analysis of evictions by month. This general output provides localities the ability to understand when housing loss is most likely to occur and has occurred, and when they can provide key resources to individuals and families in need. As per the data and the results we have here, we can see that the housing loss appears fairly cyclical and evictions spike in the month of January every year for the past three years. The second output of the FEAT tool is this correlation analysis against a set of 60 census variables. And this provides localities with information as to who is most at risk for eviction, such that resources can be targeted to support those in highest need. From the results, which uh, may appear fairly small here, but we can identify that in New York City, individuals who are not fluent in English are foreign born and who have not graduated from middle school are most vulnerable to housing loss. And lastly, the FEAT tool produces a packaged file that can then be imported into an open source mapping software. This really provides localities with an understanding as to where housing loss is highest in their specific community, city, county, or even state. Across New York City, we can see here that evictions have been mapped at the census tract level through the five boroughs, and that evictions are highest in the Bronx. In 2018, our data tells us that in the Bronx, there was one eviction per 79 units which is a tremendous, a tremendously large number. And yes, FEET has provided some incredible insights, but we are not finished learning and developing on this toolkit because we are continuously, apologies, we are continuously interested in diving into housing loss data to understand how it might correlate with other key factors and what other further analysis we can drive forward. As some examples here of what we're continuously exploring, we can look at cumulative evictions over time, but we can also explore housing loss by school district, by congressional district, by voting district, and much more. And this is why it's critical for us to continue to have engagement with local communities, local partners, such that we understand what would be most helpful to them in order to generate key insights to drive information to fight housing loss in their communities. In sum, the FEAT tool really provides local leaders with the tools that they need to understand when housing loss occurs, where in their locality housing loss is highest, and who is most at risk. 
This provides them with the data-driven information to provide and target resources to individuals and families in highest needs. For New York City, we've learned that evictions spike in January for the past couple of years. We also know that the Bronx has the highest concentration of evictions and that the individuals who are at highest risk of eviction are those across New York City for whom English is not their first language, who are not born in the United States, and who have not had the opportunity to graduate from middle school. And I'll share as a last slide here, um, some key resources for those of you who wanna be able to access this presentation or for those of you who are watching the recording later. Uh, we have the publicly available GitHub link that you can download in order to use the feat tool with a set of instructions. Um, the New America website also has these incredible step-by-step -step user guide and FAQs to provide additional information and context on how to use the tool and how to leverage the analysis that are provided. And last but last me, not least, excuse me, we have a fantastic blog series also on the New America website to tell you a little bit more about the use of data to drive housing loss decision-making. And with that, Caitlin, I'll hand it over to you to share a little bit more about the uh, panel, the very exciting panel that will be uh, driving forward. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a moment. Thank you so much, Mallory, for such a great and comprehensive presentation. I, uh, watching the chat, I know you uh, just wet the appetite for uh, so many um, individuals who were, um, who are listening and, and just seeing the, the comments that this is really uh, a tool that can be directly useful to so many uh, individuals and community actors here. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to invite uh, our panelists to, to cop, come on camera to, um, uh, chat, to chat with us a little bit. Um, we have Yulia Penfield, who's the Director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America, who's been Datakind's project champion for the duration of this. So from our first conversations in 2019 to, uh, you know, coming along the, the data journey, uh, dropping checks in, at, uh, off at courthouses to buy the data, um, to really just help uh, see this vision forward and to take the risk and say, you know what, as a policy organization, we can adopt uh, data science and push the, the sector forward in this way. Um, Dustin Wilson, one of our DataKind volunteers from our March 2021 Data Dive event where we first started to touch on the New York City data. Um, uh, Dustin was one of our leaders in really starting to look at these different ways we could break down the data. So looking at political district or school district and to start to make these interactive visualizations that form some of the building blocks of feet. Um, Larry Kilroy, DataKind's uh, Director of Technology um, and a just uh, a uh, technologist who I have learned tremendously from. Uh, uh, Larry has a real eye and uh, concept for how we can build community-driven uh, global goods and the impact that these tools and solutions can have on the world. And then lastly, we have Kevin O'Neill, who uh, without his investment and belief in this tooling, it wouldn't have existed. Um, we went to Kevin, uh, gosh, a year and a half or so ago and said, hey, we have this idea for a global good and we think it could work. And Kevin just came on board, was a cheerleader, was deeply invested in our workshops with community members to understand the pain points and the tooling that we needed to build these solutions. Um, so with such a, a diverse set of viewpoints for this panel, I'm just so excited to get, get started here. So um, we do have a number of questions that, that I'll be running through, but I want to offer to uh, the 50 plus of you uh, attendees here to please um, you know, feel free to put your questions into the chat as well. Um, if you don't want them recorded, uh, you can send them to me directly um, and we'll incorporate those into this conversation as well. Um, so with that, you know, uh, Yulia, my, my first question is gonna, over to you um, to say, throughout this journey of building the FEAT tool, you've made a real point of bringing together diverse stakeholders. So from jurisdictions, from policy, 
uh, from partnering with technologists to tackle this housing insecurity problem. Uh, what does it mean to you to take this community approach to uh, combating housing insecurity? And what have you learned from this process? Yeah, thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, in part of this panel, uh, you know, first I just want to uh, start by thanking Datakind for being such an important uh, Julia, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. Um, uh, I think, Louie, oh, I'm going to have to come. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So, Okay, perfect. Well, um, I will go off camera for the time being. Uh, I just wanted to uh, start, Caitlin, by thanking you and the Data Kind team, uh, you know, for really uh, not only making this vision possible, but being our partners in, you know, conceptualizing this vision and, uh, you know, understanding the link between uh, the technology and the policy implications. It's so critical. And for Rock Rockefeller for believing in this work and supporting it. So you're right, Caitlin, that um, early on in the process, uh, we did try to make a point of bringing together a range of stakeholders to really understand what would be needed from a housing loss data tool, um, you know, both in terms of uh, the development, uh, and uh, you know, the use of it. Uh, and I think that the, the reason behind that is that we found that it, you know, there's a real difference between the stakeholders who have access to housing loss data, the stakeholders who have the capacity to analyze that data, and then the stakeholders who have an interest in analyzing it. We found that those are often different constituencies, actually, for better or for worse. So without bringing those folks together, um, you know, it's really not possible to make any progress on developing a tool like this. So to give a concrete example, um, evictions and foreclosures run most often through the county courts. So it's the courts who, uh, you know, collect this data, but the courts don't necessarily have a mandate to make this data publicly available or to analyze it. Uh, you know, the folks who might want to access that data may be the local um, legal aid uh, clinic who uh, may want to understand eviction trends in order to deliver uh, services to uh, residents. But the stakeholder who will have the technical capacity to actually, uh, you know, work with this tool and, um, you know, work in uh, using Python to uh, analyze the data may be, for example, the local housing department. So as we, uh, together with Datakind, onboarded the cities in the cohort, we were onboarding diverse teams that co were comprised of uh, these different members, each of whom brought a specific piece of the puzzle. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, the bringing together these folks in a pre-step uh, to developing the tool proved incredibly useful in helping to understand um, what we would want out of a local and national eviction data infrastructure. So, uh, you know, we and Datakind and Rockefeller Foundation uh, back in December of 2020 brought together a cohort of municipal innovators, housing leaders, and technologists uh, to put on the table this question of how do you improve eviction data systems? And the recommendations that were jointly developed by that group were subsequently endorsed by HUD in a recent report to Congress on the feasibility of creating a national eviction database. And I think that without having those different constituencies in the room, we wouldn't have been able to pull together recommendations that were you know, both provocative and grounded in the realities um, that jurisdictions were facing. Um, so yeah, for all of those reasons, I, I do think it's really important to bring together diverse uh, coalitions of stakeholders to tackle this problem. Thank, thanks, Yulia. Um, I, I have to say the the power of bringing the diverse stakeholders together is, is something that we at Datakind, um, I, I really valued from uh, the New America team and something that continuously surprised us uh, where we'd heard feedback that it was 
oh, just getting the two different departments to talk to each other. So getting IT to actually talk with the rental assistance program uh, through this process was, was a huge unlocker uh, of, of the Feet tool itself. Um, I want to pop over to you, Dustin, as one of those uh, diverse stakeholders brought, brought together to contribute to this. Um, what, what has your experience been working with open data, working on these types of collaborative community tools? And you know, as a, as a back-end engineer with a full day job, what prompted you to take time to, to volunteer on this type of solution building? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, in general, I found that a lot of sort of like the, the data dives end up uh, being not too much of a lift <laughs> for, for me, e even as like a, a, a sort of a sort of leader of, of these groups, because, you know, the, the folks at Datakind uh, really do help out with like a lot upfront. So in the events that I have volunteered at, it, it hasn't been too much of a stress on me, uh, like in the days before, aside from a bit, a bit of extra work. Um, so, so, so I do want to say that upfront. Um, in terms of sort of like uh, what analyses were like interesting, uh, you know, I, I worked on this uh, almost a year ago, I think in March of 2021. And um, yeah, it was it was really nice to see uh, how much of this has sort of progressed, and how some things are are actually kind of not exactly the same, um, but uh, there are definitely elements that I see from that original data dive that sort of made it into the final feed tool, which is you know s sort of really encouraging. Um, I've worked with Open Data, I guess, um, in a few other capacities outside of data kind. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have to say that, that a lot of it is uh, uh, a lot of sort of like analyses that couldn't otherwise be done are uh, not made trivial, but like made a lot easier by the fact that it's uh, like on an open portal. And unlike, let's say, I don't know, five years ago, you don't need to uh, like, try and scrape like some Department of Housing website. It's just there, it's just on the portal. Um, and yeah, I, I think this has sort of a, a lot of positive benefit. Yeah, and I, I, it's a real testament to um, the, the commitment and investment of organizations like Rockefeller who have taken the, the genesis of an idea that, that came from a hackathon, one of data kinds, data dives, a social impact uh, hackathon on a weekend and allowed that tool to move forward and, and become something that is so open and accessible. Um, so Kevin, I, I want to come over to you as, as a leader of innovation at, at Rockefeller and, and the, the co-developed uh, program that is, is pushing global goods forward. What excited you about this project? And you know, how did you feel about the pivots along the journey? And you know, what, what's, uh, what's keeping you going now? So. Well, uh, th thank you very much, Caitlin, and uh, thank you to New America and Datakind, um, and especially um, a big thank you to the cities, the community organizations that have also been a huge part of this project, uh, and to Sabiha New America, who's who's led a lot of this work, uh, but isn't speaking today. Um, I, uh, there's a couple of things that I think have been incredibly exciting about this project. Um, and that uh, are examples of a lot of things that we look at, at for in, in the work that we support. Um, so one, this work has been really exposing the unseen. Um, for a long time, evictions have kind of been a little bit of the under the water um, part of the housing uh, crisis relative to foreclosures. And in part, that's because the data hasn't been there. Uh, so this is an effort to really broaden um, our vision of the importance of evictions and then other for, uh, causes of housing insecurity um, that in some ways are more important and in many cases impact more vulnerable uh, people. Um, secondly, leverage. Um, the, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act alone has over $42 billion for housing and homelessness. Um, if we can use data tools to make that 10% more effective, even 5% more effective, that is just incredible return on investment. Uh, 
Um, so tools like this, whether it's on housing, whether it's on lead abatement, um, uh, whether it's on access to social safety nets, um, job uh, training, et cetera. If we can make these things more effective, we're gonna be having a huge impact. Um, third, this is really an effort to kind of rebuild the system um, from a, a really fragmented uh, state. As Yulia pointed out, the data here is coming from courts, which aren't built to collect data. They're not built to stop people from being evicted. Um, and the data is fragmented across, um, you know, not just 56 states and territories, but over 3,000 county and more uh, county and uh, um, municipal jurisdictions. So there's no standardization. Uh, the data is a mess. Everybody's systems are different. Um, so we need to point a way forward to getting towards a more rational system. And I think that is going to take one concrete action and a, and a plan. And that's what FEET provides as a way forward, but also the type of coalitions um, that are being built by New America and others. And I'm really glad to see HUD and others um, looking towards this effort as, as, as to point a way for it. Um, and then the last thing I'll point is that I think that what the functionality of the tools that exist today is really just the beginning. Um, right now, this tool is describing the problem um, much, much better than ever before. Um, and that in itself is a leap forward. Um, but I think where we really see a lot of potential is even going beyond that and thinking about can we um, offer people help before they get in trouble, before they get to eviction um, proceedings or et cetera. And the fact that we're working with um, individual level data in this tool um, shows the path forward to um, a really more advanced uh, sort of system and set of tools in the future. And this is uh, the kind of coalitions that uh, New America has built and the type of technical expertise that DataKind has brought in um, really uh, pave that path forward. Uh, gosh, uh, Kevin, I could I could keep uh, I think jamming on all of these ideas of just really making the invisible visible and and seeing a path forward on solutions. But I want to pick up on something you said about you know this is uh, I kind of interpret it as like tooling that can just yield these these you know changes of ten percent better investments or you know directing uh, resources ten percent more efficiently. And that it, it's the tip of the iceberg that that this journey is allowing us to rebuild the system and use that to go over to you, Larry. You, you've spent your career building tools and, and making data visible that that was was previously inaccessible. Um, when you think about building lasting global goods, um, you know, what are some of the promises and, and some of the pitfalls of this? And, and where do you see the future of this work with, with data kind of new America? Uh, thanks, Caitlin, and thanks everyone for being here because uh, I think FEET is an example of the type of solution uh, that the world really is desperately in need of. And so the more we can all think about how to create more of it, uh, the better off uh, we'll be. Uh, I think that digital public goods are inherently different than kind of standard data pro products in the market, uh, primarily because standard data products often aim to be disruptive. Um, they try to think about a marketplace and they propose a solution, whereas uh, what makes a solid digital public good is really one where the constituents who are the subject of the data have agency in the tool. And I think this is a great example of that, where uh, this tool it has been created uh, conceptually to continue to be used at the community level. Um, be used to solve problems of the actual constituents who represent the data. And that I think is kind of a primary uh, focal point of any good digital public good uh, is that it really is a tool for the communities that are affected by the problem that it is investigating or solving. Uh, I think another piece that makes, uh, that is critical for successful digital public goods and products is support, and this is again an example where we have Rockefeller and New America and Datakind, all partners who can offer different types of support and resources. Uh, we touched upon earlier um, the work that New America did, bringing together stakeholders and the commitment of the, of the funding from Rockefeller, as well as the dedication of Datakind and Datakind volunteers. 
uh, to do the technical work. And that is another piece that often uh, isn't always there in tools that don't quite make it uh, as a sustainable solution. Uh, so that's another important part is really doing the pre-work around all of those partnerships. Um, finally, I think one piece that is often overlooked that makes a successful digital public good uh, is curiosity and the will willing willingness to learn. Um, there's an old open source tenant that often the most striking and innovative solutions uh, come from realizing that your concept of the problem is wrong. And that's something that I think is really important to keep in mind. A lot of uh, solutions start out with their heart set on what the finish line looks like. Uh, and that's not actually uh, always the best path forward. Usually uh, taking the time at each stage to learn uh, and taking uh, time at each stage to retrospect of what is working and what's not working uh, will get you to a product that has a lasting and sustainable and maybe scalable impact uh, on a problem uh, rather than thinking you know everything going in. And I think that's another uh, way that this team in particular has really operated in a way um, that demonstrates how that can lead to a successful tool. I think just to wrap your question up, um, it's always helpful to think about digital public good tools and data tools as are they expanding upon an existing base or you know, scaling or expanding or potentially uh, covering the, the number of problems that it solves uh, by additive uh, code or additive data sources, open data sources, uh, and or is what you're setting out to work on going to be one of those foundational tools um, that you expect people to build on. Um, and that really, uh, as Kevin alluded to, opens up the problem 10% more, it gets you 10% further down the road. Um, and that's another thing that I think is really important for a mindset of people who hope to build uh, lasting, sustaining uh, solutions uh, that really serve the community is to always keep in mind uh, what stage of that spectrum you're on. Are you really adding on top of a known quantity and you're, you're solving more problems? Or are you really setting up others to solve a greater set of problems? Because that really helps you and teams uh, like Dustin were on uh, to start thinking about um, where you put your effort into the tool. Is it into the code? Uh, is it into the documentation? Um, and that really allows us to uh, make the most of sometimes limited resources. So uh, I'll leave it with that. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, your, your point, Larry, of, you know, just being able to say, the concept of your problem is wrong and you need to be able to adjust. Um, I know, Yulia, we had this experience where we did a, a great deep dive into three jurisdictions. We expanded that to five more. And then we're like, you know what? Let's do a hundred more. But we realized building a solution like that meant that data kind would always be doing the work. Um, and that wasn't the, the right solution. Building feet to allow anyone to do the work was, was truly the transformative pivot. Um, and, and I want to kind of pick up on that, Yulia, to say like, in this process, we've learned a lot about eviction data and, and where we capture it, where we don't capture it, and, and also where sometimes evictions lead to unhousing but are never actually filed as evictions. So my question to you is, is to talk a little bit about the, your specific areas of work and, and learnings from this about where, where is the data useful and, and maybe where are places where it's, it's not useful or even, even harmful and how have you thought about that as, as you've opened up data sources and data tools? Yeah, thanks so much, Caitlin. And I was also smiling as Larry was uh, you know, uh, describing this incorrect conceptualization of the problem because I was thinking of the exact same <laughs> scenario of our the pivot we did from you know, just trying to scale to collecting data from more and more and more cities and counties to actually turning around and empowering city and county leaders to do this work themselves. Um, so, I, you know, I think that um, in some ways, the most useful pieces of eviction and foreclosure data um, are the ones that you would, that you would think of first. And they were the ones that we kind of started with and that's been validated by our um, partners that that is the data they want to see. Um, you know, one, when 
of time series and when evictions and foreclosures are happening. So as Mallory showed in her PowerPoint in New York City, they peak in January. Interestingly, um, you know, from prior research, we looked at, um, you know, eviction trends across uh, 35 different counties and found that uh, typically evictions peak in late summer and early fall. So that's obviously very useful for city and county leaders who are trying to figure out you know, both financial assistance and potential, potentially legal aid inflows and so forth. Second, uh, where in the city evictions are occurring. Um, and I think that that's why, you know, for that reason, really the um, location data and the mapping um, you know, outputs uh, from this tool are particularly helpful. Um, and that's actually, you know, a question that sort of I think began our journey towards developing feet. Um, it was a you know very striking conversation we had early in our work with uh, the deputy mayor of Indianapolis. This was summer of 2020, and uh, CARES Act funding had just begun to flow. He had about 15 million dollars that he had set aside for rental assistance, but he didn't know how to deploy it because he had no idea where within the city evictions were um, most concentrated. So, you know, answering questions around where uh, evictions and foreclosures happen. And uh, what we have found is that uh, sometimes it's in the places you would expect and sometimes it's not. And then that prompts um, deeper questions around, you know, what is accounting for these spikes. Uh, several of the cities we worked with were very interested in the landlord side of things, understanding are there serial evictor landlords. And in fact, we, you know, in some cases uh, have found that in census tracts where sort of, uh, you know, going back to Valerie's um, demographic data correlations um, uh, presentation, you know, the demographics would not point to high concentrations of evictions, but nonetheless, we were seeing them. Uh, you know, when our partners dug deeper, they found that there were specific landlords who were filing huge numbers of evictions. Um, you know, so that data is quite useful as well. Um, you know, the second part of your question, um, you know, are there areas where data can be harmful? Um, I think that that's, you know, that's a really interesting question and one that we have run into, particularly in the state of California, which seals most of its eviction records. And, you know, there's a really interesting conversation around what is that balance between protecting the privacy of uh, tenants who are being evicted um, and yet providing, you know, um, analysis that could be useful in helping them. Um, and in uh, the state of California, one of our partner cities, uh, city of Hayward, uh, we sort of saw them navigate that balance in real time. Uh, the, uh, the city had no data on evictions because the county, the Alameda County Court seals um, all of the evictions. And uh, through the, the process of developing this tool, Hayward County or Hay city of Hayward approached the Alameda County Court and basically came to an agreement with them that the court would provide de-identified zip code level eviction data, which was sort of a happy medium that allowed, you know, the um, for the continuation of, you know, protecting the tenant privacy while providing the city with at least some useful data as to where evictions were concentrated. So I think that that's a question that will become all the more relevant as this work progresses and continues to be developed. And I think that there's an interesting conversation to be had around kind of levels of permission and who has access to what types of data. And, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a whole other conversation um, that we could have, uh, but I'll stop there. Thank, thanks, Celia, for for you know just actually acknowledging that there there are potential harms with this type of data, and there are data protections in place that um, we do have to weigh and and be cautious about. You know, so much of this data is public, but it's individuated data about perhaps the worst day of someone's life, and and we as data scientists do have an obligation to handle it responsibly and and ethically and and humanely. Um, 
And so, Dustin, I, I want to come over to you, um, both as a data kind volunteer uh, data scientist, but also as someone who spends your day as a, as a back-end engineer. Um, what is your perspective on the types of sort of next level data pipelines, data protections, the solutions that we should bring in um, to make this type of open source tooling and open source data more widely useful and accessible? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of making data more uh, useful, I think that for the most part, a lot of agencies that can do the most with this sort of data um, might ha not have invested in sort of uh, uh, investing in sort of like the data infrastructure that lets them uh, either share their analyses or run their analyses um, sort of uh, uh, repeatedly really quickly. Um, I think that uh, tools like Feet do a good job in making it sort of very clear and taking uh, practices that maybe you see in like open source or academia where it says this is exactly how it works, this is how you should proceed, um, and then sort of like uh, allowing um, anyone who wants to to just sort of pick it up and run with it. And, and that's great because that empowers people to, you know, um, uh, actually use the tool. Um, in terms of like uh, an absolute sort of next step, is that uh, in addition to sort of being able to run your analyses, like you have uh, maybe uh, constituents um, and you actually need to like provision the infrastructure, you need to make this public and put this on the internet um, and, and that type of thing, I think there's also room to grow, um, but there's just uh, so much complexity that goes into like um, hosting a, uh, mapping platform that updates, uh, let's say monthly or however often these raw data sources update. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in finally, and maybe this should have been the, the first comment is that before all of this, you need to have like really great sort of domain experts who understand like what is the actual schema of the data, because you've got, um, let's say hypothetically, like some eviction data that, um, uh, maybe uh, generally is the same, but there's some nuance that if you're strictly an engineer and sort of treating it as, yeah, it's a list of lists, uh, I'll uh, just fire it off into some database, uh, might be overlooked. And this is kind of the area where you, you really cannot overlook things. Um, yeah, so th there are lots of sort of like little nits and challenges that I've uh, sort of picked up in a few years of doing this, but uh, I think those are the big ones and those are the big challenges that organizations need to overcome. Uh, those those are, are so spot on. And, and Kevin, I'm gonna come over to you to say, you know, you're investing in building out tooling for infrastructure. You're, you're a real convener and bringing people to the table. Um, how do we ensure that people using these types of tools have agency or are part of the decision-making process for that tool creation? That's a that's a great question, uh, and I was glad to to hear uh, Yulia and Dustin and others highlight the the critical question of ethics and how data is used. Um, so one thing to highlight: this has been produced by a process and by a coalition of stakeholders um, and community organizations and cities and et cetera. And um, we really believe that tools should be a product of processes and people and inclusive processes. And I certainly hope and think this will be the case and we can work on this. Um, that, that will be replicated as cities and communities start um, grappling with the type of situations where that Yulia described, where um, the data is productive and, and for good reason, um, but there's also a legitimate and really important use for it. Um, and getting um, buy-in not just from an input, not from just from uh, organizations, representatives, government, but also directly from people is important. Um, at the same time, while there is a legitimate use of misuse, even for data that's already public, um, there is also a huge risk in not using data for public good um, and for people's good. Um, and in many cases, the, the data is being used already um, for private ends. Um, and it's the public sector, actually, that is uh, sort of agreed to or 
uh, defaulted to a restrained terms of engagement in terms of using it for the benefit of people. Uh, so if we can, um, you know, generate the right processes to make sure that it's used in the right way for the right benefits and people understand that, I think we'll, we'll, um, we'll be moving forward. Um, and, you know, we're in open data week. Um, and in many ways, open data, I think, is sort of the tip of the sphere, uh, the sphere. But we need to develop better institutions for having the conversations about how do we use data better while still preserving privacy and protecting people. Uh, the kind of negotiations that Yulia described in Alameda. Um, and that is a muscle we haven't built and a set of institutions that we haven't built. Um, and as we go forward at Rockefeller, we're looking forward to supporting not just the convenings and coalition and network building that can build uh, the right kind of decisions, um, and include everyone, but also the kind of institutions that can help us uh, make these decisions that we've never had to make before. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. Th thanks so much, Kevin. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with you, Larry. So 30 seconds for the last word of what's next for Datakind. What's next, next for Datakind? We, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Uh, most of those 10 years have been spent thinking about the art of the possible. How does machine learning and AI support uh, and improve uh, the problems that humanity faces. Uh, and what's next is we're really focusing on becoming an engine of creation for these types of solutions, uh, focusing on things like scoping at the front end, thinking a lot about sustainability and agency, uh, and then finally uh, support. So supporting our volunteer teams and supporting uh, the partners that we have uh, that we and those connections we make so that uh, we don't hand off tools that aren't don't continue to be useful for a partner, for example. So really, that's that's the 30 second version is moving from the art of the possible into an engine of creation of these solutions. I love it. And, and thank you to everyone in this room, all 50 plus of you who, who joined the, the live conversation and many more I know will be joining us online. Thank you so much to our panelists here, um, Larry, Kevin, Dustin, Yulia. Um, and then Zia and Mallory for giving us such a uh, wide view of housing loss and using data to tackle those uh, problems. We, we look forward to continuing to work on the front lines of these challenges with you and to bring uh, open data to bear on these problems. So please stay in touch with us at DataKind. And uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of Open Data Week.